Mr. Vincent Stancato, and he'll be speaking on the topic of data monitoring and surveillance with respect to cannabis legalization. Mr. Stancato is the Deputy Chief Coroner with British Columbia's Coroner Service. He was appointed Deputy Chief Coroner in British Columbia in August 2013. Vince was previously a coroner and regional coroner and has worked for the BCCS since 2003. Prior to, to joining the BCCS, Vince worked in a variety of capacities for the Ministry of Attorney General and the Ministry of Solicitor General from 1996 to 2003. He managed several crime prevention projects, coordinated the Provincial Restorative Justice Program, and was director of the BC Safe School Center. Vince attended Simon Fraser University, where he completed both undergraduate and graduate degrees in the School of Criminology. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Stankato. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Excellent. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. And I know it's nearing the end of the day, so please try your best to stay awake. Um, I'll do my best to, to be as entertaining as possible. I'd like to start out by thanking the CCMTA for inviting uh, me to present here um, at, this, at this function. Like Rachel, this is certainly a different audience for me, um, dealing with death. Uh, typically, we're speaking with physicians, health practitioners, police, forensic pathologists, and, uh, and most importantly, family members of deceased people. So it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to be here today to, to share uh, some of what we're doing with you folks. The intention of, uh, of my short presentation is to outline the role and mandate of the BC Coroner Service for those folks who don't understand what we do as an organization. I'll do that quite quickly. Then to discuss uh, data collection challenges that, that we as a coroner system face, and that I think coroner systems, both lay coroner systems like ours and medical examiner systems um, throughout the country face with respect to detected levels and contributory uh, uh, levels and, and findings uh, when it comes to marijuana. And, and certainly just to talk about some of the next steps, which I think is, is uh, the most important, uh, at least moving forward, um, uh, piece to take away from, from today's workshop. So our organization, uh, the, 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 the coroner service, the mandate of the organization is up there. I'm not going to go through it, but essentially it is to ensure that we're, uh, we're examining all of the factors that contribute to death in order to improve community safety. So uh, despite the fact that we have a number of questions we're mandated to answer as a service, uh, really the focus for us is on public safety, it's on prevention, it's on making recommendations around um, uh, future safety so that we can prevent uh, death in similar circumstances in the future. The service itself and the role of a coroner is pretty important for me to articulate to you folks because certainly much of what I've heard this afternoon when it comes to, to leg the legislation um, and, and to policies, even certainly Rachel in her presentation, uh, the, the focus is certainly on legislation and on fault finding and we are certainly not a fault finding organization. We're a civil regulatory regime. We instead focus on finding fact. And so it's the fact that we, there's no culpability to our investigations that give us the, the extreme powers and authorities we have around search and seizure, around really um, doing almost anything um, to, to determine and to answer our mandated questions. We're an independent investigatory body as well. We clarify the circumstances of all sudden, unexpected, and unnatural death for the public record. So death is a public fact. Any of you folks in this room, if you have the name of a deceased individual and you want to find out how they really died, you can just request a coroner's report and, and that report would be, w w will be sent to you. A lot of individuals don't understand that, that death is certainly a public fact and, and that, uh, that those reports are available to you folks. Coroners and I think most importantly, make recommendations to prevent future loss of life in similar circumstances. So coroners can either do that in one of two ways. They either do that through uh, a coroner's report or a judgment of inquiry is what we used to call them, or they do it by holding what many of you have heard of, an inquest. Now, inquests are not as, uh, as popular as, as you would think. In British Columbia, we hold about 12 to 15 inquests a year, and those are usually either um, mandated by the Coroner's Act, um, so those cases are usually police-involved cases, or there's a significant public 
issue or concern that uh, that that is of such uh, I think value to to the public that the chief coroner will uh, will call an inquest into that matter. And then the coroner's role, as I said earlier, is independent, and and really it is about determining the facts of a case so that we can serve all of the broader needs um, that you see up there, including the deceased, his or her family, and certainly societal interests. The service itself um, investigates all deaths resulting from violence, misadventure, and accidents. And so with respect to motor vehicle incidents, um, uh, we, we will investigate every motor vehicle incident that occurs in the province. Uh, I mean, even if it's an individual that dies naturally uh, while driving a, a motor vehicle, we will investigate that. Um, and part of the issue is, is that in our province, a physician can only sign a death certificate when the death is natural. For all other five classifications of death, um, it, it's got to be a coroner signing, including, including natural. So coroners in BC are mandated to answer five questions. So essentially, we establish the identity of the deceased, so who died, and that sounds pretty simple, but it's not always. So you can think about the notorious feet. Uh, you can think about individuals that die that aren't um, easily identifiable. Um, we deal with issues around decomposition. Oftentimes we're using, you know, things like forensic odontology, anthropology, and different services to do that. So we identify who died, where they died, when they died, how, and so what, oh, sorry, who, what, <laughs> when, where, and how and by what means the individual came to their death. And so that's essentially the cause and manner of death. And those are critically important for us. So in 2016, we investigated about 10,300 deaths. There's usually around 35,000, give or take a, a couple thousand deaths in the province of British Columbia a year. We, we investigate about a third of those. And, and our numbers grew significantly over the past year and a half. Uh, for the longest time, we were investigating around 8,500 deaths a year, and that was pretty much we could budget and, 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 and know that we were gonna be in and around that number, and then two things happened the introduction of, of medical assistance and dying legislation and the numbers that, that we anticipated um, were certainly way under uh, what we are now investigating and then the opioid crisis which has just um, really uh, taken hold of our province and this year we're expecting about 1,400 deaths. It's gonna account for probably the, the, the largest number of deaths in any one category in the province outside of natural this year. So of those 10,300 deaths, 315 of those were motor uh, vehicle related uh, incident fatalities in 2016. So that just gives you a picture of, of what we deal with annually. So in terms of data surveillance, pre and post cannabis legislation, it's gonna be critical. And, and I think the focus this afternoon in the session that we were, Rachel and I were just in, and, and even with Rachel's session, it's certainly gonna have an impact for all of us in this room, and it'll certainly have an impact for coroners because we, like with the opioid crisis, are often looked upon for fatality-related statistics. And so uh, the, if you take anything away from this, I think that both coroners and medical examiners systems throughout the, throughout the country need to do a way better job and need to gear up for what's gonna be expected for us. We were a little bit ahead of the game in British Columbia around the opioid crisis and around putting statistics together uh, and, and collecting our data. We are already starting to focus our energies towards um, uh, some of the, the protocols we need to put in place to collect the right data uh, with respect to, to cannabis use and driving. So with respect to MVI deaths uh, by type of road user, just to give you a little bit of a picture from 2007 to 2016 inclusive, so over 10 years, drivers accounted for 45% of the fatalities that we dealt with. Passengers, 19%, pedestrians, 18%, motorcyclists 11% and then other road users like cyclists, longboarders, skateboarders, um, uh, elderly individuals and their scooters accounted for about 7%. The top three contributing factors, um, and I'm gonna be referring to 2013 statistics. Uh, unfortunately, these are the best statistics and the most complete stats that we have. Um, we don't have anything more recent, but the numbers are, are relatively consistent is what I'm told. From our review, driver impairment, weather and road conditions, and speed are the top three contributing factors. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to get into a debate around the whole issue of distracted driving um, because that's certainly an issue. And I think that, that um, one, of the, one of the problems with respect to 
distracted driving, which anecdotally is probably should be considered in the top three, is likely the same reasons I'm about to discuss with why we have such trouble around cannabis use in terms of there being uh, a level that we can provide to coroners working throughout the province around whether or not it's contributory or not. So those are the top three contributing factors, uh, and again, with the proviso that distracted driving is certainly in there somewhere. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to go into uh, a, a whole bunch of the, the research and studies. We just heard a presentation on that. But it is important to, to at least cover off a few topics before I get into some of our data. And that is that it's almost universally accepted that marijuana impacts judgment, spatial perception, motor coordination, and reaction time, therefore increasing accident propensity. In most developing countries, drug-impaired driving is at least anecdotally thought to be on the rise, and particularly among young drivers, who interestingly, according to actually quite a few studies, um, are twice as likely to drive after smoking pot than they are after drinking, which I found quite interesting. And a meta-analysis of multiple studies uh, referred to in the last uh, workshop over in room A, has found that the risk of being involved in, crash, in a crash significantly increased after marijuana use. In a few cases, the risk actually doubled. Now that is sort of contraindicated by the fact that um, a large case study, uh, a case control study conducted by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration found that there was no significant increased risk uh, attributable to cannabis contro um, after controlling driver's age, gender, race, and presence of alcohol. So what does that mean? That means that there's obviously quite a bit of disparity around uh, what the research says out there, and, and that disparity is also causing organizations like us um, uh, issues and, and problems as well, because there is no, no set limit, no per se limit, with respect to that that we can give to coroners to use um, as a sort of guide. So I'll get into that in a little bit, but with respect to coroners, how do we Typically, so what we've heard is uh, a lot in the last workshop around how you deal with individuals that are living and how you conduct roadside tests and, and, um, and, and involve drug recognition experts. Well, the, the folks that we deal with are unfortunately, they're dead. And so we typically rely on toxicology testing. We utilize the Provincial Toxicology Center um, to conduct all of our testing, uh, all of our post-mortem testing. Now, on drivers, we have a policy in our province that every driver is, is, uh, is tested um, for their toxicology um, uh, and impairment levels. Uh, what we don't do, it, and I'll get into it in a, in a little bit, is we don't autopsy every driver. Uh, in the province, and so that's critically important when you when you're thinking about whether or not there are other factors that might have led to an individual uh, uh, coming to their death. So you know w we might talk to a driver and find that they had some alcohol and some THC on board, but that person might be 65 with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and some other factors and a past myocardial infarction, and they might have uh, for some reason either fallen asleep at the wheel or suffered a cardiac event. And, and went off-road. Um, if the person has injuries that are, that are uh, consistent with, uh, with death and they're visible to a coroner, a coroner might actually choose not to conduct an autopsy in that case, and we may lose some critical information. Other sources of information that coroners uh, will look at is obviously they'll conduct thorough scene investigations, typically in coordination with the police, We'll certainly rely on police reports and collision analyst reports um, and, and certainly a review of, of any and all pre-incident events. So we'll seize video if it's in a location that has video. We will, we will uh, certainly interview any witnesses and, and conduct our investigations accordingly, which will assist. So the challenges for our folks around uh, identifying cannabis as contributory are, are, well, there's quite a few. The, the main one for us is there, it's easy for us with respect to alcohol impairment and for, impairment and for coroners. We have excellent data around alcohol impairment and, and its involvement. Um, unfortunately, because there is no legal limit, whether folks agree that a per se limit is, is, uh, is the right way to go, for us as coroners, um, because we have over 150 staff in the province that are investigating death, we need to be able to provide a standard. Without a standard, folks are going to be left with, with essentially determining on their own account whether or not it was a, a, a contributory, even when detected. 
and, and in some cases even at the same level. So you might get an individual with similar circumstances in a similar level of, of marijuana in their system in northern British Columbia and someone down in the lower mainland, two different corners are investigating that death. One might call it uh, the, the marijuana use is contributory, the other may not. Secondly, since individuals have different degrees of impairment at the same THC level, coroners must decide whether cannabis was contributory on a case-by-case -case basis. I essentially talked about that uh, in, my, in my earlier example. And then also, thirdly, circumstances may suggest multiple possible contributing factors. And I spoke just about the natural uh, preconditions uh, that, that sometimes we won't get at autopsy. But we also consider things like road conditions, weather, speed, um, vehicle malfunction, uh, are the tires balding, um, was there fault on behalf of the other driver? So you might be impaired and deceased but you were driving in your lane and a truck crossed into your lane and we have excellent uh, collision analyst data to, to support that. Are we going to, to, to look at that cannabis impairment as being contributory? And as I said earlier, natural, natural, uh, natural preconditions. And so the other issue is that coroners are going to attribute uh, contribution differently and, and even sometimes at the same level. So the challenges for us, and we're just looking at my watch, I've got a few minutes. The challenges for us around identifying cannabis as contributory are, well, there's a few. So certainly, what level of THC impairs driving ability? That's the big question for our coroners. At what level? The level at which THC begins to impair driving ability is unclear, as we've heard um, throughout this conference, and may vary depending on an individual's tolerance, whether they're a chronic user or not. Um, and that tolerance level varies individually. Most studies of cannabis impaired driving um, compare, and this is a critical factor, THC positive drivers with THC negative drivers. What they, very few of them do is assess crash risk as a function of THC concentration. And that was actually discussed in the last session as well. That's important for us in terms of whether or not we determine something to be contributory to a death or not contributory to a death. And then estimates of THC level that can be assumed to produce elevated crash risk generally place it at, as we've heard, uh, 5 nanograms per milliliter in blood. However, opinions vary. So how do you know that a driver has used cannabis? Well, for us, the PTC, our Provincial Toxicology Center, tests for two metabolites of cannabis, 11 nor 9 carboxy tetrahydrocannabinol. I know that's a mouthful, which we heard earlier as an inactive metabolite. It does not indicate impairment, and the issue with it is it can be detectable in blood uh, or urine for days after cannabis use and sometimes even upwards of a month. The other uh, uh, um, uh, test that we conduct is on delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Now, this is the active metabolite. Detection may or may not indicate impairment, depending on the levels detected, but it generally indicates fairly recent use. Uh, but, not habitu but habitual cannabis users may have detectable THC in bud for over 24 hours after the fact. So that, again, it's difficult for us in terms of, in terms of um, utilizing it. The other, the other factor that really comes into play for us is, and I, d I don't have a slide on it, but I can tell you that oftentimes when, when we're looking at cannabis use um, in our talk samples with drivers is it's almost always mixed in with other drugs. It's very rarely the only drug that we find in a driver. Oftentimes it's associated with alcohol, cocaine, or some other, some other drug, which makes it, again, quite difficult. <clears throat> so just in terms of some of our statistics, so from a coroner's perspective, the current reporting on cannabis impairment and MVI deaths, um, option one is looking at the number of deaths with cannabis detected. So looking at deaths from 2011 to 2013, with, and these were driver-specific deaths with cannabis detected, you'll see the total of driver deaths we had uh, really ranged in and around the 120 uh, mark over the three years. And of those, we found the, active, the metabolite of, of, uh, of uh, THC in roughly 11, 16, and 16%, 16 so an average of 14% um, over time. Now, uh, in those, if you, if you look at um, uh, what, how we, we, we took those statistics, took those and then put them with all of our 
traffic-related fatalities and how many were contributors. So you saw in the last slide the percentages were in and around the 15% mark. Well, when you take all of them, including drivers, and you look at the number of deaths where coroners actually called it uh, called THC use as contributory, you'll see that number drops to in and around the 8% mark with a total of 6 to 8%. So again, that tells you just because we're finding it detected, we're not finding it, we're not finding it uh, contributory at the same level. And in fact, most of the time, it is alcohol that, or some other hard drug that is seen as, as the more contributory drug. So the limitations, as I said earlier, with, our, with the current data is there's no legal limit standard. Um, uh, there's uh, certainly no standard that we are using across the province uh, amongst our corners. Um, and coroners work uh, autonomously across the province, and so they, they certainly, um, uh, uh, although we provide them with policy, there's law around, uh, around what they're mandated to do. We certainly uh, allow that coroner to independently come to their conclusions uh, and findings. And so we, we don't intervene, but what, what our responsibility is is to provide them with the best data possible so they can make the most uh, standardized decision uh, possible so that that individual up north that dies in a similar circumstance to the individual down in the lower mainland we're, we're, we're seeing the same uh, results in terms of what the cause of death is and what might be contributory so coroners may attribute contribution inconsistently and the role played by marijuana in crashes is often unclear because it can it can be detected in body fluids for days or even weeks after intoxication and because uh, people frequently combine it with alcohol and that's a, a critical factor for us. So just quickly, and I know we're at five o'clock, how do other jurisdictions report on cannabis uh, and MVI deaths? So I'm gonna just quickly talk about Washington State and Colorado. So with respect to Washington State, the way that they essentially look at their data is they look at, rec we all know that recreational cannabis use was legalized in 2012, and they did establish a per se limit of five nanograms per milliliter for drivers. A recent report on marijuana involvement in fatal crashes in Washington from 2010 to 2014 reported on the following. So this data um, looked at the number and percentage of drivers with detectable THC levels in blood of greater than one nanogram per milliliter. The number and percentage of drivers with THC levels of five nanograms per milliliter or greater, and the number and percentage of drivers with only THC detected. Now, interestingly enough, they, the, the, the same study found that uh, following legalization, there was a 50% increase in the prevalence of THC in drivers involved in fatal crashes, and that increase started around nine months after legalization. The issue with that is compared to what? And, and again, they weren't using the same standard um, that was being used before. And so I anticipate that we're gonna see some massive increases even in our province if a standard or a limit is set. And so we need to be geared up for that. So the authors note that the presence of THC uh, does not indicate impairment or being at fault. Um, and again, for us as an organization, we wouldn't either. The data available cannot be used to assess whether a given driver was actually impaired. Now, with respect to Colorado, sort of similarly, uh, uh, you'll see they use that the limit, the, a reasonable inference limit of five nanograms per milliliter for drivers. In a recent report that looked at deaths there from 2010 to 2015, um, reported on the following data. They reported on the number and percentage of traffic deaths related to marijuana, so a little bit different than Washington. A breakdown of marijuana-related deaths by road user type and other drugs detected in drivers positive for marijuana, which I think is critical. Now, the marijuana related, okay, anytime marijuana, what that meant for them was anytime marijuana showed up in, toxic, in the toxicology report for the driver, uh, marijuana appears to refer to detectable levels of greater than one to two nanograms per milliliter. And the authors noted that marijuana related does not necessarily mean that the incident was caused by marijuana use. Interestingly for them, they reported a 92% increase in cannabis related traffic fatalities between 2010 and 2015 or 2014 and a 32% increase in traffic uh, deaths in just one year in 2014. So just a couple of key points, takeaways. Um, so for motor vehicle uh, driver deaths, toxicology results are the most used source of information about impairment for coroners. 
Roadside sobriety tests are generally not feasible, at least for us in British Columbia. Um, there are mixed views on whether impairment can be assumed at a given THC level. We know that for sure. And if so, what this level should be. And jurisdictions reporting on traffic-related fatalities tend to limit their analysis, and this is critically important, to the number and or percentage of drivers testing positive for THC while acknowledging that the test results may or may not indicate impairment. So just some considerations for, for individuals in the line of work that, that I'm in and for coronial services and medical examiner systems throughout the country is, you know, coroner decision-making in BC regarding the influence of THC and vehicle-related fatalities will continue to be inconsistent without, if not a legal limit standard, a standard of some sort that we can, that we can take, use, and provide to our folks such that we have a basis so that when we're providing data, we can say and articulate, this is what we're using as our threshold. We also think that that's not enough in BC for us to understand the problem in British Columbia and how, or how uh, provinces that have, uh, um, uh, uh, that are moving towards the legalization or countries moving towards the legalization of, of marijuana, that there needs to be universally established methods of testing for intoxication. So what we do in our province and what we use in our province should be used, you know, uh, at least, uh, it, you know, in our opinion, should be something that's, that's national. And I know that the uh, chief coroners and chief medical examiners are going to be ma meeting later, later this year, and this is going to be certainly a topic that they discuss. Um, but, it, you know, in terms of what it is that we use, whether it is that per se limit, whether it's roadside testing, drug recognition experts, the use of laboratory testing, or a combination of all of them, um, it's critically important that, uh, that it's understood uh, on a national level and across jurisdiction. And then lastly, coroners and medical examiners in Canada need to begin exploring methods of data for data surveillance so that we're prepared to assess the impact of legalization. And I don't believe that we're geared up for that at, at the present time, but it's certainly something that we're talking about as an organization, and I'm hopeful that other jurisdictions are as well. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, we'll open the floor for a short question session here. What would be your recommendation on how we can and what support coroners would need to talk about data consistency or what would be some of your recommendations? So it was around data consistency and, and recommendations. So I think, I think the first thing it, for, for us is that there needs to be, we're a lay coroner system, and, and medical examiners and coroners are focused on really answering the questions that I talked about. So I think there needs to be agreement at the table and amongst professionals, folks like individuals in this room that work in this industry, folks like uh, representatives from, uh, from, from the coroner service, to come together to come to some sort of a standard. Without that standard, and, and I don't know what that standard might be. It might be a limit, it might not be, it might be something else, but I think that we need to come to a, a place where there is a standard. And then I think it's about training. It's about taking that standard and training coroners across the board in terms of how to apply what they do and, and, and connect it to that standard. Without that, the data, is, the, the data is just gonna be unreliable. With respect to our data around drug use right now, where we really lead the country, I think we do because we have a set standard, we have the data, and we have consistency protocols in place. So uh, other than that, I don't know how. Uh, I can say that this is, this is the last question, so Paul. And I. <laughs> I can tell them that, uh, I can mention that Transport Canada in 2011 came up with a standardized protocol for coroners. We have it, we've been trying to promote it, but we haven't gotten very far yet. So it's not about developing the standard, it's about now figuring out how to use it. So that does exist already. Have you presented that to the chief coroners and medical examiners? A few times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and usually you get ushered out of the room very quickly <laughs> because it's about money, right? And they essentially keep saying, well, build the business case so we can get the money to do this. So it, that's where it gets hung up. Well, I'd be interested to, to talk to you about that. All right. Thanks, everyone.
Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, offer uh, two tokens of our appreciation to our, both of our speakers on behalf of the board and uh, the rest of CCMTA, and thank you for speaking.